Sculpture Prize ถือวิเศษ JSPA Dean Keynote Speaker Panelist JSPA Faculty Staff Distinguished Participants Ladies and Gentlemen On behalf of Graduate School of Public Administration JSPA NIDA I would like to extend to you all a very warm welcome to the book launch event for how to make an entrepreneurial state why innovation needs bureaucracy My name is Fernanda Jansukri JSPA Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs It is my honor to be the MC for this special event. First of all, please allow me to provide a brief overview of this groundbreaking book. The, other, the authors of this book include uh, Professor Rainer Cattell, Professor and Deputy Director at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Second one, uh, the second author is Professor Dr. Wolfgang Drexler, who is with us today. He is honorary professor at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and professor of governance at the NERSC Department of the Innovation and Governance at Tallinn University of Technology or Taltech, as well as associate at Harvard University Davis Center. The third author is uh, uh, Professor Erki Carroll, associate professor and head of department at the NERSC Department of Innovation and Governance at Taltech. The authors explore how public bodies pursue innovation, looking at how new policies are designed and implemented. Spanning Europe, the, the USA, and Asia, the authors show how different institutions finance new technologies and share cutting-edge information. They argue for the importance of agile stability, demonstrating that in order to successfully innovate, State organizations have to move nimbly like startups and yet ensure stability at the same time. And that particularly in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, governments need both long-term policy and dynamic capabilities to handle crisis. Today, we are honored to have Professor Dr. Wolfgang, one of the authors, as our keynote speaker for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Wolfgang, Wolfgang Dechsler. Uh, would like to, to have a speech? So, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to be back in NIDA. Uh, which is always uh, wonderful, and to this time have as a topic the launch of the book that I wrote with uh, Rainer Kattel and Erki Caro on innovation bureaucracies. And um, it's, of course, a particularly beautiful setting for this because uh, Thailand is such an interesting country in the context of both innovation and bureaucracy, and uh, NIDA is, of course, the flagship institution dealing with this project and uh, one in which we have cooperated since many years. So my first thanks go uh, to the employee for uh, having kindly consented to, to host this event, and then, of course, to um, already my fellow panelists to uh, discuss the book. It's um, uh, when I see other academics promoting their books or even articles on Twitter, I always feel a little bit annoyed because it's so boring to have all these generic professors hawking their books. And it's like, yeah, enough already. I understand you wrote a book, great. But um, of course, if you spend a lot of time and if it distills a lot of work um, that you have pursued over the years together, th there is this proud thing about your baby that you do focus on this a little bit more than maybe would be decent in more modest times. Our times of social media do not cater towards modesty very much. Um, so it is really nice to, to talk about this. And uh, uh, traditionally, in a book launch like that, um, what I should really start with is to give you a quick summary because we cannot um, expect that everybody has actually read the book, which is rather on the sick side. It's not enough for a doorstopper, but it's a solid hardcover book, right? Mm -hmm. And um, to start with, and perhaps this again is a good, a good NIDA point, um, in today's society, uh, in today's global economy, um, there is no alternative to innovation as a main driver of economic development as well as for social development. Um, 
innovation classically defined in this context in the way of something new that is brought successfully into the market and that also has the tendency to push new paradigms of technologies and techno-social arrangement. So as many have seen in the various societies and worlds they've been in, if you stick to your old business model, your old ideas, at some point, even if it was positive, they become obsolete. You can't just do this stuff anymore because ways, marketing, financing, and so on have simply shifted. And if you keep doing things in the same way that was successful yesterday, if you do it today, you lose the connection, you lose the added value, and so on and so on. And that can be catastrophic also on a national level as well as on a regional level, of course. That understanding is not special. You know, there are not many people around today who would say, I'm opposed to innovation. Innovation is a positive term, certainly for policymakers, and to find somebody who said, no, we don't need any innovation, that is very rare, yeah? So it's clear that we need that. Um, what is not always clear, but amongst innovation experts is clear, is that the role of the state in innovation is immense. Yeah? Um, so many people dealing with innovation have a business perspective or even a startup perspective, but you cannot lead the larger trajectory of innovation to private initiative. Um, you can do propaganda along these lines, politically speaking, but it just doesn't work. We have almost no examples where this works. There needs to be a state coordinated effort in certain directions and it needs to be done in a certain way. You need in societies that are less pro-innovation um, uh, state measures, state frameworks within which entrepreneurship is possible. So this is clear. For this, what we then need from the state side is what you call innovation policy. And innovation policy, that means when and how and where I should, from the state side, design policy that encourages beneficial in innovation, beneficial for us all. This is a big research field. There are many universities who deal with that, many books. Um, you can look at it this way or that way. There are various perspectives you can take, legitimately so. This is what academics is about. But we have various views of how to look at that. Now, where does now our book come in? The interesting fact is that while we have a large literature, big discussion, and many state actors dealing with innovation policy, very often, almost always, these books, these thoughts, stop at formulating the policy. This is the best innovation policy for this place in this time. This is already something, but it's not enough. Those of us dealing with public administration, and I'm a public administration, expert at heart, uh, expert, I don't know, specialist, say. Um, what we know is that implementation is half the rent. Um, I always say for 20 baht and a good policy, you get a coffee, you know, meaning it's worth nothing. A good policy, if you just phrase it, it just stands there. It, it makes no sense, yeah? It's like, you know, you may have the policy or not. It needs to be implemented. And the implementational level of public policy is what public administration is all about. How do you actually implement good innovation policy? How do you do this well? If this is the case, don't we, um, don't we know about certain track records of successful countries, countries that were innovation leaders, that have managed to implement good innovation policies well in time and space. And this question, uh, very surprising, um, was something that was almost not covered in the existing literature. This was really missing. And um, as you know, if you have an academic background, the best uh, motivation to write a book is if you want to read a book and it's not there. And then you say, okay, it's not there, then I write it. Yeah? So, uh, it's the same with movies. There's something that's happening and then, you know, I make a movie about this, this, this constellation. And, and it was really the same issue here. And this was this team that went together that has been uh, particularly um, 
in, a, in, a, in an almost emotional sense, sympathetic to me because Rainer Kattel, the first author, he's my first PhD, the first PhD that I have advised, whereas Erki Caro, the third author, is his first PhD. Mm -hmm. So we are actually a grandfather, father, son <laughs> combination, <laughs> if you will. It puts me in a pretty old <laughs> position, of course, <laughs> but I can live with that. But uh, we, uh, and, and it's both times the first time. So Erki is the first PhD of my first PhD. So we have an, uh, a generational following like this. And um, we have been dealing with that from various perspectives, but come together in the consensus of this book. So this is the question. Uh, this is the question that is faced. Um, how do I optimally design um, the implementation of innovation policy? Because what we do know is that the shape and the capacities of uh, the implementational level of bureaucracy is what really makes the difference to the success. Yeah? Um, the capacities of the individual in charge as well as the design of the institutions within which this happens. And this is what this book is about. How do you design optimal administrative structures for the implementation of innovation policy? And also for the creation. And um, there has been, yeah, I now need to watch that I don't take everybody's time away, which is much more interesting than what I say, but many of you might have heard the term public sector innovation. But too often, public sector innovation does not mean this, what I was just talking about, that means designing optimal innovation policy, but it means the innovation in the bureaucracy itself so that the bureaucracy looks modern. And that's nice. And if people like me say nice, they probably mean it's not that nice. Yeah, it's a slightly condescending nice. That's nice. You're, how does my dress look, honey? It looks nice, you know, like this. Um, and uh, uh, while it is important that the public sector changes with the times, the important thing is it's never enough. It's not the look of an office that counts, it's whether they do innovation policy in all, including in the private sector and in state or enterprise as well. That is the real challenge, and that is why PSI is not enough. So how should the organization of innovation policy then look like according to us? And this I can answer, as you already mentioned, with the two words that people who have read this book so far has picked up the most as the main short message. And that main short message is agile stability. In spite of innovation privileging agility, and as important as it is, it's not enough for the long term, for the distribution, for trying new technologies and funding this in the long term, you do need classical structures that are able to uh, think longer, distribute longer, almost something like classic bureaucracies. The problem is it must be highly motivated and competent classic bureaucracies because we have a lot of classic bureaucracies that don't help innovation. They just sit there and are happy about their salaries. That is not what we're talking about. So you do need both. You need agility and stability. And in too much of the talk, we have overly focused on the agility. These are people who say governments must look like startups. No, they must also look like startups, but not only. It's really important to have both time axes and to have the long term, the short term, the deep knowledge and the nimbleness at the same time. The ideal thing we found out when researching this with the most successful innovation regimes is that the best thing is if organizations that deal with that, for instance, an innovation unit in the Ministry of Economics or the National Innovation Agency here, um, have this in their organization. That means that people have the dynamic capacity to be stable and agile at the same time. But if we have a group, an ecosystem, in which there are agile and stable institutions, such as an iLab and the more classical bureaucracy, that is still something and can absolutely work. The problem starts if you don't have both. This is when, when the issue starts, and I think what the book does a moderately good job in is to show with the case studies why and where this is the case. So um, I will finish by saying that one of the um, 
criticisms that you hear of that is to say, yeah, agile stability, this is demanding a lot. This is, I mean, agile stability, most bureaucracies are neither agile nor stable, you want both. And the answer is that, sorry, but yes. This is a very high demand, indeed, to ask public agencies to be agile and stable at the same time, but think of what the alternative is and think of what the price is. The price is a truly innovative, innovation-loving, innovation-supporting system. And that and how that came to pass was what we tried to show in this book. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Thank you, Professor Wolfgang, for a very inspirational speech. Now it is my honor to introduce the moderator for the roundtable discussion. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Proy Suvisset, GSPA Dean. <laughs> and I am honored to introduce the distinguished panelists. Today we have uh, three more panelists. Uh, two of them are from the academic, academic field, and one of our panelists is from the practical field. So you will gain a lot of insights today. The first one, uh, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Dadua Sakri, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs of GSPA NIDA. The second one from Academic Field is Professor Dr. Igo Prasadjo, Professor of Public Administration at Faculty of Social and Political Science, University of Indonesia. He is also Executive Secretary of Steering Committee for National Bureaucratic Reform. And last but not least, Dr. Tin Thawit Taranon, Advisor and Acting Deputy Executive Director of Electronic Transactions Development Agency, or EDDA. It is under the Ministry of Digital Economy and Society. He is an expert journalist and innovation philosopher with a wide range history of working experience in both public and private sector. So he will share a lot of viewpoints with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome again to our moderator and panelists. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to see um, many faces that we are all coming here for one, one goal, to be learning more about the book, which is very important. And uh, we have our distinguished scholar here and our good friends. Yeah, we uh, have met many years ago. Right, and Professor Wolfgang also is the one that I most respected. Especially, let, let me tell you about this book, the one that catches my attention is always about bureaucracy. And Professor Wolfgang and I share the same passion that bureaucracy is not a bad thing. And if we do it right, then it's, it's necessarily, and it's very valuable thing that human can come up with, I think, um, some of you might, might, might not agree with me, but let us think in more alternative ways that really bureaucracy, if it's not that good, it doesn't stay long until 150 something years, right? Almost 160 years already. So that means something. And Professor Wolfgang is one person who has never changed the idea that this is just the thing that we need to look at uh, seriously and do not follow uh, the mainstream or something that try to devalue bureaucracy because it's not that bad, all right? So let me um, ask Professor Aiko first, all right? Uh, what do you think about the book after you, you have read this one? Uh, you can take the microphone. Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ploy. Uh, for giving the time for me and congratulations to Professor Bob Gang, my best friend, and also Rainer Kettel, and also Erki Karu, yeah, as writer, uh, and also uh, participant in this uh, discussion. I think this book is uh, very important and very nice to read, yeah, uh, since uh, we have uh, so many fundamental changes, yeah, in. Uh, in the current situation, yeah. So at least we have a comprehensive and completed uh, globalization, yeah. As a strategic uh, environmental changes, yeah. And also advanced di digitalizations, yeah. The era of uh, digitalization, 
uh, and changing and shifting the generation, yeah, so-called uh, millennializations, and uh, of course, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we have been facing for almost 20 uh, months, uh, more than 20, uh, 24 months, yeah, two years. I think uh, what uh, very important in the book is uh, this book talking from the beginning into the, the end of the uh, explanation is uh, the so-called agile stability. Yeah? So uh, how state bureaucracies fundamentally can uh, and must support uh, the innovation. Yeah? across the economy and also society yeah, with these uh, fundamental changes. And so that's why to play this role, uh, the bureaucracy needs uh, stability and also agility as uh, explained by Professor Wolfgang. Yeah. Uh, stability in the bureaucracy yeah, consists of, as we know, established rules, uh, regulations, ethics, culture, and procedures. Yeah, to deliver public services and also making the goals of the state uh, achieve. Yeah. But also, as I mentioned, that um, the bureaucracy needs also to be agile, uh, uh, means that ability to shift, to shape, and also to respond in a creative and creative ways yeah, to changing contextual condition and also uh, policy problems. Yeah. Uh, even a so-called weak problem, yeah, like uh, poverty, uh, crimes, uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, and even after COVID pandemic 19, yeah, a need of agility in the state yeah, is uh, very important. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, there is no no normal process of policy making. Yeah. Uh, uh, we know that uh, the integrations uh, from policy expertise into the policy making is very uh, closer now. Yeah. And no one uh, full competence in dealing with COVID-19, so we, we learn and after, after COVID. Yeah. And we need more uh, multi-actor and multi-institution yeah, to solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, need more uh, public and also private collaborations uh, using the global data and also big data for policy making process and also facing the existing of uh, new social problems. Yeah. Uh, but we learn the extensive uh, public experiment and also experience uh, during COVID yeah, like uh, working from home, uh, elect, uh, distant learning yeah, and, and new social uh, adaptation. Yeah. So we are facing the uh, facing the agility era, yeah, uh, and the nature and scale of uh, global trends and shifts are forcing the public sector organization, the bureaucracy, yeah, to be agile. Yeah, that means uh, moving toward to a, a flatter structure, striving more equality and also opportunity sharing strong uh, vision and purposes and also making continuously innovations. Yeah. Uh, agility is, need, is need, it needed to help the public sector effect a major transformation yeah, to size opportunities and also to achieve its objective. Yeah. Uh, but oh, agility is not an end yeah. uh, in itself. It is a prerequisite for being uh, truly strategic yeah, in the stability. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after reading uh, the books, I think what are the benefits from these books? I, I, I divide into three, uh, three benefits yeah, from these books. Yeah. First, uh, these books uh, explain so many uh, examples in the past, uh, how the countries cope with the problems. Uh, for example, PTR in Germany in 1887, yeah. DARPA in, in US governments in 2009, and also MITI in Japan uh, 1980s. Yeah. This is some uh, example, and, and so many examples in this book that show that actually agile, agile stability is not 
uh, new, but we experience already uh, in the past, and will continue, I think, for the next future. Yeah. Uh, this is what we learn. Yeah, very interesting to learn to study how the countries solve the problem with uh, agility and also stability. As we know that bureaucracy normally based on uh, rules. Yeah. Uh, rules should be enforced, yeah. <laughs> making uh, stability, but the, uh, the expectation and hope and also uh, strategic environmentally uh, changes uh, make the bureaucracy needs to, uh, to be agile to respond to the fundamental changes. Uh, the second one is uh, the book lays the foundation for debate yeah, between various experts. For example, debate uh, between Schumpeter and Weber, debate between uh, Weber and Tocqueville. This is very interesting yeah, in this book <laughs> to, to make um, how we, we, un we can understand the uh, agility and uh, stability yeah, for the uh, various perspective of uh, scholars yeah, and experts. Yeah. And the third is, I think, uh, for practices. So as Professor Wobgang explained, yeah, um, we need innovation policy, but also uh, make sure that this uh, policy can be effectively implemented. Yeah, this is not easy, actually. So I have the government of Indonesia since 2006 as a consultant, also expert, and now being a the executive secretary of the vice president for uh, bureaucratic reform. The problem is actually how we develop the uh, dynamic capabilities amongst the civil servants, yeah? uh, and also in, in the relations to the politicians yeah? as uh, uh, parties who have uh, responsibility, power, and also authority. Yeah? Second one, we need uh, strong leadership. Uh, national and also in the ministries and also in uh, national agencies as well in the provincial and also in uh, local governments. Uh, and also uh, implementation strategy. So good implementation strategy, how the innovation policy can be uh, effectively implemented uh, in a bureaucracy who orient uh, orientation is on the stability of the uh, regulation and, and so on. So, um, I think uh, in Indonesia we face uh, three uh, fundamental problems yeah, in uh, making agility in the, in the bureaucracy. One is um, the multi-party system who has very um, strong interest in the bureaucracy, uh, the political interest. The second one is uh, the quality of bureaucracy uh, I mean the culture and also the competencies. And the uh, third one is the decentralized, decentralized governments. Yeah. So Indonesia is very uh, big uh, country with many, so, so, so many islands. Yeah. So in the, in the local governments, I think we need to develop the capacity and also the capabilities bigger than to the central governments. Uh, because we have already decentralized the authority and power to central, uh, the local governments. So, um, and um, uh, the development of bureaucracy depend uh, locally on the local elite yeah, and, and so on. So. so I think this is all my uh, opinion about this, uh, this book. Again, congratulations, Professor Bob Gang and friends uh, who write this uh, very nice and very important book and I will promote also to our government. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Eko. Um, agile stability is something that uh, we catch and then we, given, we are given the example from your country. Uh, interesting because Thailand is just the kingdom of Thailand. We do not have um, the government just like uh, in your country. Now, I think uh, we come to Dr. Tin. He may shed some light on um, agile <laughs> stability. Do we have that in Thailand? Have we had that before? Or is this uh, our uh, future practice that we should uh, get from this book? OK, 
Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's, it, it is my very honor to, to be invited to this session and uh, congratulations to, to uh, Professor Wolfgang as well. And um, it's, you know, first of all, it's very difficult to um, explain about the words, um, you know, agile versus stability because literally is, you know, it's contrast in some way. And it, it, it looks like um, Agile is, you know, it's kind of um, practically implemented with the um, private sectors, especially startups. But if we talk about the government, especially in Thailand, uh, uh, in terms of the size or in terms of the structure, the structure of the government in Thailand is very large uh, compared to uh, other countries in the same size of Thailand. So um, back to the word stability. We have a very strong bureaucracy and we have a strong culture as well. Um, for example, if you talk about the, um, the academic when you go to the schools, right? Um, in Thailand, we have a culture that our teacher is the one who knows everything in class. So it's very difficult for students to debate or make an argument with the teacher. That's, that's the root cause of Thailand. So we step up to the uh, working uh, time, uh, especially with the government. It's the same things that I, as I mentioned, because um, the boss or the big one in the, uh, uh, in the room will be the one who are truly true, and we cannot be, you know, debating with him. So this the, this counter is very difficult to promote innovation uh, in, in 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 some sense. This one thing that I I uh, stick in my mind because um, my experience I I I used to work in the um, private sector and I got back to the um, um, public sector, so I, I, I saw the both sides of the um, uh, working environments. So after I um, read his book, and I, I think um, this book is very holistic view in, in terms of um, explanation of the policy implementations as well, and uh, the, the, I love the arguments um, between you know, agile and stability, uh, according to um, Max Weber and, and the Schumpeter one. And um, there, I think there is no right or wrong from that argument. Uh, it depends on the context. It depends on the situations. And I, I do agree with uh, uh, Professor Eichel that after we got the pandemic, the COVID-19, um, how do you say, the problem that it's very stick to our governments is dig, you know it's is it's been you know digged up and we see the problem um, very clearly like clearer than before that the government in Thailand has lots of um, systemic and structural problems to be agile so back to my um, real experience as of now, I, I'm working in the uh, Ministry of Digital and Society. And you know, my uh, office is the first one in Thailand to become agile. But the problem is, we know what to do, and we don't know how to do. We implemented, we have implemented the agile concept to, the, to our organizations um, to, for two years. And you know, the first year, it's so messed up because we only know that Agile is flexible. We know that Agile is, you know, it's the principle of startups. But, but comparing to the you know, government mindset, which is a very root cause of the, you know, uh, of the government in, the, in, in now, nowadays. And we don't understand uh, what startup do in day-to-day -day basis, but we only know the principle. 
as Professor Wolfgang say, it's the hardest part is um, the policy implementation. So we set so many rules to be agile, but we cannot apply it to be more practical in day-to-day -day basis. So that's the, uh, that's the thing that I learned a lot uh, after reading the book. And um, I think last but not least uh, in this round, um, I, I think the, the most important part of his book is we see the problems you know, in a different perspective, in different contexts, in different countries, especially uh, in Europe, in Asia, and of course in America. You see that a lot of um, differences or some differences in many countries. But uh, if you see in Thailand, I think Professor Wolfgang will be, uh, we, we do more some research and you, you, you see some um, deeper causes of the problems to be more agile. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Din. Now we come to Professor Danuwat. Do you have any ideas? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dean Ploy. Uh, well, well, ten years ago, I I first heard the word entrepreneurial state and the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. I have followed for quite some time, and today was a great pleasure, you know, to have you here, and for all of us, and also uh, for the Facebook Live, okay, here in Thailand. Uh, first of all, congr congratulations, okay, to you and uh, the other two co-authors for publishing this book, and also we have to congratulate the readers because they have chance to read a very fascinating book, actually. Well, I received this book about a week ago, okay? It's quite a short time, but I try to uh, spend most of my time uh, reading uh, this book. As I said, very fascinating, so it's, it's difficult to, to stop reading. Well, uh, what I've learned for this book, well, apart from the 10 years time that I had followed the word entrepreneurial state, is about agile and stability. I think this is the key that for those of you who are later on going to read this book, you've, you will learn a lot from this. Well, before in economics, we know that the government is here for us to correct market failure, okay? But for the entrepreneurial state, the role of the state should be changed in the more creative way, okay? Not just the role, but if you read this book thoroughly, I will, of course, gonna read it for the second and third and perhaps, you know, fourth times. <laughs> like well, a movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a good movie, you know. You repeat uh, watching it again and again. Well, and, and yes, uh, I think you will see that not only the role of the state should be reshaped, but also the structure of the government and, and bureaucracy, okay? If we do not change, you know, not only in Europe, but for, for Asia and, you know, in, in your country, in ASEAN as well, well, I think we will be so lagged behind the speed of change in the world. So I, I emphasize on the term transformation after I read this book. It's a must. The state can no longer be too complex. The state and bureaucracy can no longer be to initiate. The state and bureaucracy can no longer be so much resistant to change. So I think, well, my experience reading this book compared to what I've seen in Thailand and perhaps in other Asian economies, countries, most of the time, our public sector always resists to change, okay? When, when they hear the word change, even uh, being agile, I know that, you know, may, maybe more than half of, you know, uh, your employees in, in your organization will say uh, no, or even they do not say no, they think no. <laughs> they might say yes, 
Okay, they might say yes because in Thai bureaucracy, perhaps you have to say yes first. But in their mind, they resist that. All right. But as I said, you can no longer okay think like that because at the end of the day, if you still resist to change, you still being you know in the chair, your country cannot deal with all the challenges that we are facing. But recently, about a week ago, we hosted the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Okay, and we talked about the BCG model, the bio circular and green. So if you want to deal with these challenges and go for say green growth, you have to <laughs> use the thing that Professor Wolfgang wrote in this book. Otherwise, just like Dr. Twin said, it's just going to be only the word. And you cannot really tackle. Okay? We are facing the world. We are actually aiming for the goal that is different from the past. In economics, you say we need to have growth. But the growth that we need today is different from the growth when I was in my undergrad. We need maybe green growth. We need innovation-led growth. We need so different kind of, of growth to deal with climate change, to deal with you know, a new pandemic, to deal with you know, some international conflicts even. So I think it's time after I read this book to, to say to whoever I know, in, especially in public sector and also my students, that it's time for us to keep, you know, moving forward and it's time to make to make change and I think most importantly we need to change our mindset and this book can help you change your mindset because it's, if, if it's a top-down policy okay and especially in in a conventional public sector you often see a top-down kind of policy and yeah in your mindset no 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 but you need to to get this kind of insight Okay, that you need to change. And Professor Wolfgang actually gave us a big clue how to change. Because if you say, yeah, we need entrepreneurial state, why not? But the question is, are there any mechanisms or the key? Okay, so this book is like a key for us. So in order to be, you know, entrepreneurial state and even entrepreneurial society, you need to be agile and at the same time stability. And I think from, from my uh, point of view after I read this book, I think that is the key that perhaps in the, fast, in the past we have not yet found. Okay, so I think this is very important. So uh, congratulations again. And I think it's very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Danuwat. I, I think that's something that, that my students might find that it's quite new is the role of the government and entrepreneur. In the past, we separate this, right? A government is government, and then you, you promote the private sector to be entrepreneur, and then to have that kind of sense and new PM, right? Yeah, and then this is when you merge that, how can the state be and think like the entrepreneur? This is quite new, I think, for our students. And especially uh, what Professor Danuwat also said and, um, and Dr. Tin said, it's very traditional thinking in, even in our bureaucracy. Like how can we be entrepreneurial and, and become state? They are not quite clear how. So this is the book that, that would give you some um, groundbreaking ideas. And uh, Professor Wolfgang, do you want to say something more? Yes? <laughs> yeah, ask a professor whether he wants to say something more. <laughs> What's he going to say? No, thank you. <laughs> no, okay. certainly not. Um, I think it's really important 
um, how you started when you said that you and I have this kind of positive attitude towards bureaucracy. But for most people in the world, bureaucrat is an insult. It's not an objective term for a civil servant, but it's a, if you say you bureaucrat, you don't mean yeah. I like you. <laughs> we so. mean it like PA scholars, Dean Ploy and I, as describing a specific part of the public sector that in its best also traditional shape, 120, 150 years ago, actually did focus on public-private partnership as we showed. Um, if it is new now, then because of a recent past and of a degeneration of the traditional state. A um, hundred years ago, the best governments did do this kind of strategic planning towards this form of innovation. And I think actually we have uh, great examples in, in Thai history, in capitalism and proto-capitalism, that points in this way, mentioning here just the administration in the middle part of Rama V, and also of the late periods of the Ayutthaya government, which is very surprisingly planning towards certain economic successes with world success. With, with global success, right? Later, Ayutthaya is, is a super successful country. So, um, but what um, I, I thank all three of you for your extremely generous words. This is very kind of you, and this, uh, this practice feedback has always been very important um, for this book and the interest in, in the practice. Um, I'm uh, particularly honored to see Her Excellency uh, Dr. Lama here, the representative of Kosovo in, in Thailand, with whom I had already a great discussion about that, and it is great to see how government on the highest level picks up these questions. So the challenge is obvious. But um, what all three of you have emphasized, of course, is the need for stability, uh, for agility, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. not a Freudian slip, just a mistake, <laughs> um, is the need for agility in systems that are um, uh, resistant to change, resistant to future planning, not capable of these things. I, um, it is the typical academic reaction now for me to re-emphasize the stability, which none of you denigrated, but I just want to underline it again. The best stable governments push stability by themselves. Systems that look stable and that do not push for nimble, agile reaction to problems that come are not good traditional bureaucracies, but bad traditional bureaucracies. Mm. And it is really important to see that both of those, um, the, in the ideal bureaucrat, if I may use this word, both really come together, and I realize that I do need both at the same time. It is, once again, so important, but um, sometimes, you know, um, bureaucracies seem stable, and they are not stable, they are just old-fashioned, and they're actually big, but they are weak. Uh, and there is, you know, we don't have to go too far in the region to look at some of those. <laughs> and um, I think it's really important to say that um, the best stable administrations are also agile. So this is all I would say at this point. Um, right now we have one hour of um, the brief introduction or um, points that, that our panelists uh, um, have. And then now I think it's a good time that we welcome questions from, from the audience. And um, since we also have the online as well, right? We have online live. Um, do you have any questions uh, here in this room to ask Professor Wolfgang since he is here? But, uh, so he can, okay, please, uh, microphone, please. Oh, okay, thank you. This is working. So it is a pleasure and it's fascinating to listen to you as much as it is to read you. So just one question that is popping up my mind. Have you thought of developing a kind of international index of agile uh, stability, because we know that many countries and governments are striving to make the best, but that is like a kind of um, incentive for them. It's a motivation, and it's also we need maybe to change the old indexes, like that of the growth, to move towards a new mindset and to shift some paradigms so have you thought of it? And of course, if you have thought of it, it will require an effort, a lobbying effort, right? Not only by academicians. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for this uh, very good uh, questions. Now, um, uh, uh, I think that academics are only fun if you can go against the mainstream. And one of the things where I'm very much against the mainstream is that I'm notorious for being anti-indicator. I always say indicators are not evidence. And uh, too many governments follow empty indicators, checking boxes, rather than doing good things for their citizens. I absolutely appreciate this um, competitiveness element that you brought in, basically something like a FIFA score, right? And you know, we want to be the mini Saudi Arabia of innovation policy, if you will, to win over the others. Um, something like that. And as such, it's certainly appreciated. But um, I have to say, uh, complex indicators uh, that convince me are extremely rare, even within the EU and on the European level. I know of a handful of comparative EU indicators that I could possibly accept. And uh, on the bureaucracy level, I know none. Um, so I know some uh, economic ones, but you would have to be really so careful, both for the empirics and for the math, that um, the complexity of the task might eradicate its usefulness already. Um, so I appreciate the input, but this is the first thing where I would say, um, uh, wait a minute. Um, I, I would think, if I may say so, in a personal capacity, that in such an indicator, actually, Republic of Kosovo could score quite well. Thank you. Um, our students, yes, Cesar, you can press the microphone there. He's our exchange student. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, your presence here. And uh, I must say, it was the title of the book actually caught my attention, and that's why I'm here today listening to your talk. And I think it was really uh, inspiring and uh, enlightening as well. Um, I have a question which I also wrote here just uh, to make it quick. Um, when I listen to the word entrepreneurial state, I also think of the concept of state capitalism, and where the state, you know, is undertakes business and commercial. Um, ac economic activity for profit. So the, the state, in a sense, in that concept, as we understand, is highly involved in the process to look for innovative ways to develop industries in the national economy. If one contrasts Southeast Asia and Latin America, um, in specific countries in, the, in Central America and in the Caribbean, it seems that uh, the Southeast Asian region has many of the key root characteristics for nurturing agile, stable, but also adaptive uh, civil servants across public institutions. What is your recommendations for, for Latin American countries? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my classic answer to be asked about regions that I'm not super familiar with is my first recommendation is not to listen to people who look like me because they have a lousy track record in uh, supplying advice to areas in which they really don't know. And I'm not even starting to talk about the World Bank here. So um, the only country, uh, the only countries I can say anything in Latin America about is Brazil and Peru, because with these two I am familiar. And um, in Peru it was, if you will, tried. And in Brazil it's very successfully done, because that has a uh, that is a country with a strong heterodox tradition looking at exactly these things and the entrepreneurial state. Um, I should say here, of course, state capitalism and the entrepreneurial state are not exactly the same, but as far as state-owned enterprises, for instance, is concerned, um, I am, I'm usually not a pragmatist, but in this one I'm a pragmatist. What works, works. If a state-owned enterprise as such produces and produces additional value, added value, for the citizenry, that is totally fine with me. Um, what can you transfer, if at all, from Southeast Asia to, to Latin America and the Caribbean? Very complex task. I actually, in another thing, did, uh, did get involved with a uh, thing about that with the uh, um, American Development Bank. And um, the important thing is there that you don't go on, on too high a model. Of course, one of the classic success models in Southeast Asia is Singapore. 
And one of the worst things that countries in various parts of the world have been doing is to try to copycat Singapore. It never works because there is only one Singapore yeah. and there is only one Singapore printing machine and there is only one, only one Singapore civil service pay. You know, yeah. I mean, this is, this, you cannot transfer it. If people tell me they're copying Singapore, you know, I'm, I'm saying sorry to hear that. Um, although I think it's a extremely well-working country, to make this very clear. I just don't think it's very well copyable. What, um, what we are missing, let me evade your question with an answer, with Latin America and Southeast Asia. Um, as has been mentioned, the book is very much about Europe, um, the, the top performers in East Asia, and the United States, North America. And there is a problem with books like that, that you either look at the total successes or the total failures. But we by far don't have enough entrepreneurial state and entrepreneurship and innovation policy studies about the mid-level countries in which so many people live and which are so important to either upgrade within or move up. And that is a topic um, which really deserves more attention on so many levels and which is potentially extremely fruitful. And I am, when I was asked that first about this book, I, I, I have to say, I am really sorry about that. It again looks at the top example as case studies, but um, to fully and fruitfully answer your question on a calibrated level, as stupid as it sounds, more research is needed. Thank you. See, sir, that can be your, uh, your dissertation topic. <laughs> Do we have any questions from, from Facebook? We do not have any questions from online. Okay. That's actually good news. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? Maybe? Oh, sure. Me, yeah. So, sorry. We discussed uh, this morning with Professor Wolfgang yeah, about the agility and stability in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> For a long time tradition, uh, Germany is very stable. Yeah. But uh, I just wonder that Prof. Kang explain that uh, Germany lost their not only agility but also now the stability. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you could explain yeah, as uh, for our lesson learned. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Wolfgang. Yeah, in public criticizing my country abroad is my favorite enterprise. <laughs> so thank you very much for this question. Yeah, no, I'm always glad if I'm not asked about Germany, so I don't have to complain, right? The next thing is you ask me what I think is the chances of Germany and FIFA. So, um, but what the German model shows, Germany was the leading agile, stable country 125 years ago, in my opinion. It was even doing better than the UK and other big countries. Mm. And today, what we know is that Germany is doing extremely badly as far as digitalization is concerned. This is what everybody will tell you who deals with the German public sector. And they say, well, we are very stable, but we can't do this digital agility. And I always say in Berlin, um, and sadly I say so, yeah, but you're really also not that stable anymore. Yeah. That means these old bureaucrats who may be boring and overly conservative, but who really know their fields, who really have, if you will, a traditional mission-driven impetus to solve the areas in which they work mm -hmm. and who will, if they're not agile themselves, encourage ability, uh, agility because they know that if things like COVID come along, you need to solve this in an agile way these get less and less. And, and, and I think Germany is a perfect example to see that um, uh, we cannot assume that traditional regimes are still stable. Yeah? Even that is a challenge. So you need to look at both at the same time. And this is where I see the challenge. The one good thing in Germany is that there is more and more attention to exactly this fact. The, if you will, academic capacity to talk about these things is relatively high. Um, that's why you got your PhD from Germany, right? Because there is this kind of level of discourse. But altogether, um, um, again, I agree with all that has been said about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial state, agility, digitalization, and so on. The, the if you will, onerous message from our book and from my perspective is even that is not enough. Yeah. So this is where we go. And uh, this is what we face, but once again, um, 
if, if all countries and if we as a whole, also our community, does not face this challenge, the, the, the price we will have to pay is extremely high. We have one uh, question from uh, Facebook. Uh, the, this person, he asks, what is the definition of an entrepreneurial state in this book? Ask Professor Wolfgang. Thank you. Okay, I'm not even going to answer that, but it gives me a wonderful platform. Um, and it's something that you have pointed out because you have uh, the background in that. So the concept of the entrepreneurial state, how we use it today, was really done by our London uh, director, Professor Mariano Mazzucato, who is one of the leading and perhaps the leading heterodox economist in this field today. And, uh, you know, she was uh, very closely involved with the various green changes and uh, the, the health summits now uh, is in the advisory council to the WHO for the economic impacts of, of uh, the post-pandemic health and so on and so on. And so um, she has written an extremely important book about the entrepreneurial state and if you will, our book is not a companion volume, but an, a follow-up volume. This is why she has also written the preface to it, after all. And of course, the publisher put her on the, on the cover page, even not on the back, because this interests um, uh, many people so much. Let me very briefly say that the entrepreneurial state is a state that acts as an entrepreneur, but also in the interest in purely private sector as well as public sector entrepreneurs themselves as well. So to be entrepreneurial is important. It is also, and that is really important in this theoretical background we have been mentioning, it is a prime task of the state to support innovative private sector engagement by entrepreneurs as much as possible in the right direction. That is a key state, uh, key role of the state today, and that is what this signals. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, um, I would like to thank to our panelists and also the moderator uh, for a dynamic and impactful panel discussion today. Uh, now um, it's time for group photo, but uh, please allow us a few minutes to organize the, the stage, okay? And for your information, we have some books for s um, um, yeah. that you can buy today yeah. in the front and 15% off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, plus uh, biography of professor. <laughs> that is, I need one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much, everyone. And please wait a little bit for a good photo. Thank you.